In the history of American Cosa Nostra, the threat of violence is just as important as its use, and nearly every member and associate in its history is capable. There are individuals, however, who stand out even among their peers in the underworld. These mobsters are the 30 most feared wise guys in American Cosa Nostra. Number 23, Gambino Soldier, Anthony, Tony Plate, Pilarte. Anthony Tony Plate Pilarte was born on April 2, 1913. He was raised in the Bronx and before long began to gravitate toward a life of crime. His first brush with the law occurred in 1931 when he was only 18. He would be convicted in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania on a possession of stolen property charge where he received a small fine and a slap on the wrist. Palate would hit the big time in 1936 when he was arrested for robbery in the state of New York. He would serve time in Sing Sing Prison where he would associate with members of the Mangano crime family. A few years later, after making these connections, Anthony Palate would be made into what was by then the Anastasia crime family in the 1950s, where he would serve under legendary mobsters Armand Tommy Reva and his mentor Neil Delacroix. During this time, Tony Plate Pilarte would begin to earn a reputation of viciousness when a car dealer by the name of Sidney Carp owed Pilarte a large sum of money and was late on his payments. The story goes that Pilarte walked into Carp's office, jumped on his desk, got in his face, and threatened to bite chunks out of it, all while spitting all over him. Other mobsters began referring to Pilarte as the pit bull due to this type of intimidating behavior. Throughout the years, Anthony Tony Plate Pilarte became a top hitman for Gambino underboss Neil Delacroix. On July 7, 1974, on orders from Delacroix, it is alleged that Pilarte shot Charlie Bear Calise five times in the head. Then in 1976, George Byram, who had multiple loans out to Gambino loan sharks, including Pilarte, was behind on his payments. Byram then compounded his problem by tipping off a burglary crew about an empty house full of valuables which just happened to be owned by Gambino Captain Nino Gaggi. The unoccupied residence was actually occupied by Gaggi and his wife, and to add injury to insult, Gaggi was pistol whipped during the robbery. For these transgressions, Byram would pay with his life. Byram would be lured to a hotel room by Roy DeMeo, where Gaggi and Pilarte were lying in wait. Byram would be shot and stabbed multiple times and was in the process of being dismembered when the three mobsters got spooked and fled. Anthony Pilarte would continue to be a top hitman for the Gambino crime family until the murder of Charles Calise came back to haunt him. Pilarte and Gambino underboss Neil Delacroix were both charged by the district attorney with the killing. However, Pilarte would not see trial. The rumor goes that Delacroix did not want to stand trial with Pilarte due to the latter's intimidating looks and fierce reputation. In August 1979, Anthony Tony Plate Pilarte left his house and never returned. It is also rumored that he was killed by John Gotti and his two close associates, Willie Boy Johnson and Angelo Ruggiero. Anthony Pilarte's life and death are a microcosm of the treachery and violence that permeates La Cosa Nostra. He will be remembered as one of the most feared gangsters of his era. Number 22. Lucchese Associate, James, Jimmy the Gent, Burke. James Burke was born on July 5, 1931 to Jane Conway, a prostitute who was an immigrant from Dublin, Ireland. The name of his father was never known. At age two, social services placed little Jimmy Conway in the first of many foster homes. They say he never saw his mother again and never knew who his father was. As with many of these throwaway kids, he was in many different foster homes and other institutions for orphans. Eventually, a family named Burke took him in as a foster child. He finally got lucky and they created a clean, comfortable, and safe environment for the teenager. He lived out his teenage years on Rockaway Beach close to Ocean Promenade. Burke never forgot their kindness and for the rest of his life he visited these foster parents and when he started making money, 
he would leave unmarked envelopes of cash for them periodically. The Burke family adopted him, and he took the family name. As he approached his later teenage years, Burke's trouble with the law became more serious. At age 18 in 1949, authorities sentenced him to five years in prison for forgery. He was passing counterfeit checks for a Colombo family member named Dominic Remo Cersani. The police made him for passing $3,000 of these counterfeit checks at an Ozone Park bank. After his arrest, Burke refused to inform on Cersani, despite being offered a free ride with all of his charges dropped. His refusal earned him Remo's eternal gratitude and gave him the reputation as a stand-up guy on the street. Remo nicknamed Jimmy the Irish Guinea. When he went to prison, Remo arranged for his protection from other mob members already incarcerated. As an adult, when he left prison, Burke was already a trusted young associate. He worked as a bricklayer for the International Union of Bricklayers and Allied Crafts Workers for a short time. The other mob guys saw him as a leader who was known to be very polite and charming, but turned on a dime to become a stone-cold killer when necessary. During the 1960s, Burke married a woman named Mickey, and they would have two sons, Frank James Burke and Jesse James Burke. He would also have a daughter named Catherine. Along with starting a family, Jimmy Burke was also building a crew that included Tommy D. Simone, Henry Hill, and Angelo Seppi, among others. Burke and his crew used Robert's Lounge in South Ozone Park, Queens as a headquarters. This joint was the hangout for Burke and his crew, as well as many other mobsters, tipsters, bookmakers, loan sharks, and other assorted criminals. Burke himself was the quintessential mobster. He ran loan sharking, bookmaking, and a high-stakes poker game out of the basement of the bar. This was all in addition to burglary scores the crew took down. There was also a hidden cemetery underneath the basement floor that specialized in the victims of Burke and the Roberts Lounge crew. A Lucchese family capo named Paul Vario took notice of Jimmy Burke's crew and brought them under the Lucchese umbrella. Burke knew how to make money and he was a real earner for Paul Vario. Also, whenever Vario needed some special work done, he knew he could depend on Burke to handle the hit. Burke and his crew robbed many trucks delivering goods both to and from New York's JFK airport over the years. They had informants inside the JFK freight yards and other freight hauling businesses. It was through this network Burke was tipped off on particularly good loads. It was bookmaker and loan shark customer Martin Krugman that would give Burke the biggest tip of his lifetime, the famous Lufthansa heist. The famous Lufthansa heist happened on December 11, 1978. The amount stolen was astronomical, and so was the heat it brought down. Jimmy Burke became paranoid about people talking to the cops, and also wanted to cut people out of their share. So Burke famously killed nearly his entire crew, or at least all of those directly involved with the robbery. Parnell Stax Edwards, a Burke associate, was supposed to deliver the getaway van to a scrapyard after the heist, and failed to do so. He instead got high with a girlfriend, so on December 18, 1978, Stax was killed by Tommy D. Simone on Jimmy Burke's orders. Martin Krugman, the man who planned the heist, kept harassing Burke for his money, so on January 6, 1979, Krugman was also killed. His body has never been found. Other Lufthansa murders suspected to have been ordered or committed by Burke for various reasons included Louis Cafora, Joe Mannery, and Robert McMahon. The one person involved in Lufthansa he did not murder was his eldest son, Frank James Burke, who drove the van that was to be used as a crash car if any cops started chasing them. Burke would, like so many other mobsters, end up dying in prison. He was convicted of the murder of drug dealer Robert Eaton and felonies related to a point-shaving scandal at Boston College. The testimony of his longtime associate, Henry Hill, put him away. He is still remembered for Lufthansa, which was the largest heist in history at the time. One should not forget that during his time on the street, he was also one of the most feared gangsters in the New York underworld, by friend and foe alike. Number 21 Philadelphia crime family capo, Felix Skinny Razor de Tullio. Felix John de Tullio was born in 1907 to Rose de Tullio, 
who immigrated from Italy to America in 1901. She settled with her family in Philadelphia's Third Ward, where she worked as a medical attendant. Felix also had three siblings, his older brother William and his younger sisters Vera and Anna. Tertullio immediately gravitated toward a life of crime and became schooled in La Cosa Nostra from an early age. At 19, Tertullio was already one of the most feared loan sharks in the Philly mob. Even Al Capone complimented Tertullio on his skills as both a loan shark and a hitman. It was during this time Tertullio received the nickname Skinny Razor. One rumor suggests that he got it because of a barber's razor he concealed in his clothing. The other rumor states that he got the nickname because he was both a sharp dresser and slim in stature. Both could be true. From the late 20s all the way through the 1940s, Felix Skinny Razor de Tullio built on his prior reputation by fighting wars for the Philly mob. Whether it be rebellious factions in the family or independent gangs such as the Lanzetti brothers, de Tullio made his name known as a no-nonsense assassin. With the upper echelon of Cosa Nostra taking notice, de Tullio's star was on the rise. By the time the 1950s had rolled around, Skinny Razor had become a captain in the mob and mentored future bosses Ralph Natale and Nicodemo Little Nicky Scarfo. Tertullio even went with Scarfo on Little Nicky's first hit. Tertullio had a problem with the fruit stand owner and his brother known as the Huckster. Tertullio and Scarfo entered the man's shop and gave him a vicious beating before stabbing him to death. Then they decided they wanted to send a message by cutting off the man's genitals and stuffing them in his mouth. This kind of brutality was not new for Tertullio, and it would send Scarfo down the same violent path. Unlike many of his contemporaries, Skinny Razor would die in his own bed from natural causes. What he left behind through Natali and especially Scarfo is a legacy of fear and murder.